You are listening to Part 19 of The Seven Medicines, The Wise Woman Way, with Susan Weed at Time Monk Radio. Hello, Susan. Welcome back to Time Monk Radio. Thank you, Gemini. What a lovely month it is turning out to be with the weather cooling down and things just starting to get a clearly leaf-turning time right around the corner there. So we were talking last week about being perfect. Have you ever found that that has been a problem for you, trying to be perfect? <laughs> Never. <laughs> oh, you must be perfect. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> it's really wonderful when we can just take a step back from ourselves and laugh, isn't it? It is. <laughs> and see how, you know, how, how many knots we can tie ourselves in through our ideas of, well, I shouldn't do that or I shouldn't do this. And the the openness and the grace that comes from nourishing all parts of ourselves. Now, I've been talking about the fact that in the wise woman tradition that nourishment is a three-legged stool. We're talking this month about lifestyle medicine and especially about the nourishment part of lifestyle medicine. And I want to reassure you once again that I'm not going to tell you what to eat or what to not to eat. But I am going to talk about nourishing herbal infusions. Nourishment is a three-legged stool. It includes what we eat and drink, as well as common everyday ritual that remains consistent and having a compassionate ear, someone who really listens to us. But let's look at actual what we eat and drink, that kind of nourishment. Now, there are basically three reasons for eating and drinking. The first is, most obviously, to satisfy our hunger and our thirst. That is, to be hydrated and to be nourished. This is, of course, very much an important part of what we are doing. But we cannot overlook the fact that we are eating also for pleasure. That eating and drinking itself is a pleasure satisfying our thirst and satisfying our hunger are in and of themselves pleasurable acts. And because they are pleasurable and because it's a pleasure that is within our own control, it is something that we frequently seek out when we need pleasure or when we need to feel in control. So there's the direct nourishment, that direct survival aspect of it. There's also the pleasure aspect of it, the joy of it, the delight of it, something crispy and and salty, something soft and mellow and sweet, something chocolatey, something chewy. We have all these wonderful flavors and textures and so... Eating and drinking bring us much much joy. And the third primary reason why we consume food and beverage is for community. Among human beings in all cultures, eating is a community event. As a matter of fact, it's one of the things that becomes difficult for people as they age, that there is less community at their table. It may get down to just a couple of people, and then one of those people may not be present, and now it's just one person. And there's something lost when we eat just one person. It was really interesting to see my mother, who resisted well past the time that the children thought that she should have given up, and resisted putting my dad in a care facility, and took on the burden of his care. But it didn't give her much companionship at her meals, and that was really the very first complaint that we heard from her about our dad. What? Not that he was wetting the bed, which he was, but that he wasn't there at meals. She said, it's like eating by myself. He's just not present. But my mom is a very active woman and is never one to cry about being in the dark, but certainly one who would not only light a candle, but light everybody else's candle at the same time, decided she was just not going to let that happen. And so she started offering a little 
cocktail hour at her apartment for the other people in their apartment complex. And she made it known that at 4 o'clock, cheese and crackers and wine would be available at her house. And sure enough, she got a whole coterie of old ladies coming by for a chat, cheese and wine. And there was her community food. We eat for nourishment. We eat because we need to. We eat for joy. We eat because it pleases us to eat. And we eat for community. All three of these things need to be taken into account anytime we imagine that we are going to change our diet. We often imagine that we are going to change our diet simply by thinking about nutrition and we run afoul of our own desire for pleasure and our own desire for community by not factoring those things in. I know the many, many years that I worked counseling people on their nutrition, um, I saw up close and firsthand how incredibly difficult it was even for motivated people to make changes in their diet unless they truly understood that they had to pay attention to the nourishment of community and the pleasure that they get from their food. So let's talk about nourishing herbal infusions. Nourishing herbal infusions do not replace much of anything that's already in your diet, although eventually they will replace some other things in your diet. We'll talk about that. But mostly we want to think about nourishing herbal infusions as an add-on. So you're going to eat whatever it is you've been eating, whatever it is you've been nourishing yourself with, whatever it is that's giving you joy, whatever it is that brings you into community, you're going to go right on doing that because you're already whole and you're already perfect and things are just great. But you're going to add to that nourishing herbal infusion. A nourishing herbal infusion is an herbal beverage that is made with dried herbs. It's like tea. Most of us are familiar with herbal tea. We've had a cup of peppermint tea or rosehip tea or chamomile tea in our lives, and so we're familiar with the idea of putting herbs in a teacup, pouring boiling water over them, letting them steep for a while, and then drinking it. Black tea, green tea, white tea, teas, that's how we make them. An infusion is different from a tea in these ways. A tea is a small amount a fresh or dried herb, while an infusion is a large amount of dried herb. A tea is a small amount of fresh or dried herb brewed for a brief time, generally no more than five minutes. An infusion is a large amount of dried herb brewed for a long time. So in a tea, we have a small amount and an infusion a large amount. In a tea, we can use fresh herb or dried herb. In an infusion, we can only use dried herb. And a tea, we brew for a short period of time. As a matter of fact, there can be some not-so-happy consequences from brewing tea for too long a time, whereas an infusion must brew for at least four hours and up to ten hours is perfectly fine. I remember the first time somebody gave me a green tea tea bag. It was many decades ago, and they said, hey, this green tea is supposed to be really good for your health. So just brew yourself a cup of tea and enjoy it. And Susan always thinks that, you know, with herbs or, oh, you know, stronger is better. The more of it is better. So she puts her green tea bag in her cup of boiling water and she lets it steep overnight. And then the next day when I drank it, of course, I should have from tea kind of sore is that you bring your hot, your hot water to the green tea bag. You dunk your green tea bag up and down a certain number of times, depending on the experts, exactly how many times. And then you put it in the saucer to be reused. You don't even let that green tea sit in the cup with the boiling water. So an infusion is a whole other class of beverage. What happens when we use dried herbs, when we use a large quantity of dried herbs, and we brew them for a long time, is that we get an amazing amount of vitamins, minerals, proteins, phytosterols, antioxidants, you name it, good, healthy constituents come out in that infusion, and they just don't come out in the tea. One of my favorite herbs for nourishing herbal infusions is stinging nettle. And stinging nettle is a powerhouse of vitamins, 
minerals, proteins, and all kinds of other stuff. A single cup of stinging nettle infusion can provide as much as 250 milligrams of calcium. A cup of stinging nettle tea has about 5 milligrams of calcium. Mm. You see, we just don't have enough herb in our brew by using a full ounce by weight of herb rather than that teaspoon or that tea bag full. We start to get these large amounts of nutrients, not just little amounts, but large amounts that have a definite impact on our health. Nourishing herbal infusions are made with a large amount of dried herb. That's one ounce of dried herb in a quart of boiling water. I generally weigh out the ounce of herb, put it in a quart canning jar, fill the jar to the top of boiling water, put a tight lid on it, and let it sit for four to ten hours. Ten hours is overnight. I may make it last thing at night, and then when I get up in the morning, I strain that infusion, squeezing the herb to get all the good out of it, and put the liquid in the refrigerator. That is my nourishing herbal infusion. What I am proposing is that you start making and drinking nourishing herbal infusions and that you add them to your diet, that it is something in the refrigerator and available for you to drink. At first, nourishing herbal infusions will probably taste kind of strong. They'll taste like they're green or, or wow, this is, they won't taste bitter, they won't taste bad, they'll just taste very intense, kind of like drinking the broth from cooking spinach. It's like, whoa, kind of eye-opening there, but really good. So you can start out small. If you want to drink just a little bit, drink it by the sip, drink half a cup. If you want to dilute it in fruit juice or water or coffee or tea, that's all fine. If you want to heat it up and have it with honey, that's great. If you want to pour it over ice, that's great too. What's best is if you drink the nourishing herbal infusion. And so anyway, you can drink it. I am totally up for it. I always think about one of my students, and she wanted to get her husband to drink nourishing herbal infusions. She actually especially wanted to get him to drink oat straw because she wanted to have more fun in bed, and she knew oat straw would help him that way. And she could not convince her husband to do this at all. And when she thought about what I said about anything goes in terms of drinking nourishing herbal infusion, she came up with the idea of using instant coffee and brewing her husband's instant coffee using nourishing herbal infusion instead of water. Of course, the first day that he drank it, he knew something was up, and he looked at her, and he said, what's in my coffee? And she said to him, well, you know, dear, I have been buying wonderful beans and grinding them for you, and I just didn't have time this morning, so I served you instant coffee. I hope you don't mind. And so because, of course, he was expecting the flavor of freshly ground beans and was getting instant coffee, he failed to notice that there was that straw in it. After about a week, she said she had to go back to the fresh brown coffee because she couldn't have any more fun in bed than she was already having. So whatever you need to do to make that nourishing herbal infusion work for you, whatever you need to do to actually be willing to drink it, that's what we're looking for. We want you to actually drink it. Now, how does a nourishing herbal infusion compare to a green drink or to juiced fruits or vegetables brilliantly is how it compares the center for disease control and prevention says that approximately half of the food poisoning incidents and we're talking severe food poisoning incidents that are reported occur due to food poisoning found on produce, especially leafy greens. Do you remember back when there was an E. coli contamination of the spinach in the United States? And the spinach was recalled, but not before some people had come to some harm. The very first person to die from consuming this spinach was a young boy whose mom made him a green drink with the spinach. So here's what happens. Bacteria, like humans, need condos, need apartments, need houses. They need places to live. 
So if there's bacteria on the surface of the plant and the plant is then thrown in a blender and blended up, what was the surface now becomes a surface at least 10,000 times greater and any bacteria that were there on that plant, and some of them cannot be washed off, will now expand to fill all available niches. It's quite possible, because bacteria have a very fast lifestyle, that within two to three minutes after making that green drink, that there will be more than 10,000 times as much foodborne bacteria in the green drink as there would be in merely eating the fresh produce. Let's look again at how we make a nourishing herbal infusion. First of all, the plant material is dried. Drying plant material does not necessarily get rid of pathogenic bacteria on it, but it sure does slow them down. Most food poisoning bacteria need at least a little moisture. They get it from the fresh plant, but once the plant is dried, dehydrated, it is basically free of moisture, and so those bacteria that had been there die. The nourishing herbal infusion is made with boiling water. If there are any pathogens of any kind, any foodborne bacteria on that dried herb, then pouring boiling water over them in general is going to kill them. Green drinks are not dried. They're fresh plants, so they have whatever components of the bacteria are on them, and not all those bacteria are bad, certainly. And um, green drinks also don't use any boiling water. So we have neither of those aids to safety and longevity going when we compare them. Nourishing herbal infusions are brewed in a tightly closed jar so that any viral particles, bacteria, molds, yeast, fungi that are floating around in the air cannot get into the nourishing herbal infusion. However, green drinks are usually made in a blender and the top of that blender is then taken off and it is poured into an open glass where it then sits around, being exposed to oxygen, losing any antioxidants that it might have had because the antioxidants are not the strong and sturdy ones that can resist dehydration, but the weaker ones of the fresh plant. And we will talk more about that as we talk more about nourishment, about how it is that vitamins are actually complexes of enzymes that are made when the plant is under stress. And so stressing a plant like pouring boiling water over it um, is more likely to result in a greater amount of vitamins available to us than doing something like putting the plant in a blender, which the plant doesn't really consider stressful on the same order as having boiling water poured over it. So green drinks, to my mind, are foolish, lethal drinks. This is my opinion, obviously. I know of no one who has come to any harm at all from drinking nourishing herbal infusions. Certainly no one who has died from drinking a nourishing herbal infusion. I have mentioned one case in which somebody died from drinking a green drink, and it is not an isolated case. Green drinks got their start with a quite interesting woman named Anne Wigmore. And Anne Wigmore had some severe problems as a child. She crawled out on her lawn, ate the weeds in her lawn, and cured herself. She, as she grew up then, she wanted to help others achieve health. And she thought she could do this by teaching them about the plants that she had eaten in her lawn. And this is why Anne and I became friends, because, of course, I had information that she was very interested in. Unfortunately, we did not become friends until later on in her life. And so in the beginning, when she was looking for how to, how to help people this way, she met some men who said to her, you can't do that. You simply cannot tell people to go out in their yard and eat the weeds. What if they eat a poisonous one? They'll die. It's not good at all. What 
you should do instead is tell people that you ate sprouts and especially that you ate wheat grass juice made from sprouted wheat. And they convinced Anne, and Anne set up the Hippocrates Institute and was a great promoter of sprouting and juicing, especially juicing the wheatgrass sprouts at the, her institute. When she and I met, it was because she had seen the failings, the problems, the gaps in this, and that she was looking to go back to what had really happened, which was eating the weeds. Unfortunately, a fire broke out in Boston at her Hippocrates Institute, where she was sleeping, and she is no longer with us. So, green drinks got their start with this idea that we would sprout wheatgrass and we would juice the wheatgrass. Juicing, of course, is slightly different than a green drink. And a green drink and adherents of green drinks say, um, sure, they might have gotten started with wheatgrass juice, but wheatgrass juice isn't a green drink because it doesn't contain any of the fiber. And I'll give it to the people who are doing those green drinks. Certainly that fiber is important. On the other hand, if you're eating salad and whole grains, you don't need to drink your fiber. The food that you're eating is providing plenty of fiber for you. And the fact that you have made a drink with the greens still in it is not the trump card that many green drink adherents think that it is. Juicing, of course, does not have the fiber in it. And this is one of the reasons that I am more fond of applesauce than I am of apple cider vinegar. Because a lot of the value of the apple is in the fiber in the apple. And when we have apple juice and then apple cider vinegar made from that apple juice, then we are not getting that fiber. Even if we buy raw vinegar and the raw vinegar is cloudy, it's not cloudy from fiber. It's cloudy from microorganisms in it. People are often shocked to hear me say that I would never pay money to buy unpasteurized apple cider vinegar. I don't care how much they would take off the price for me. I would still be absolutely unwilling to buy that cloudy, murky, yucky looking vinegar. Just not what I consider to be a tremendously healthy thing. And as we talk a bit more, we will see that um, and there are some real problems with raw food and especially with uh, green drinks and juicing because the cell walls of the plants have not been broken. And basically what I can tell you is that the, all of the nutrients in the plant are locked up behind the cell walls. So if we don't break the cell walls of the plant, then we cannot get the nourishment. Cell walls, let's think about this. Cell walls are so strong in plants that you could drive your pickup truck over a lawn and the grass would lay down as you drove over and then spring back up. The cell walls in plants provide the table I'm sitting at, the chair that I'm sitting on, the structure of the house that I'm in right now. Cell walls in plants are very, very strong. And even the cell walls in leaves are very strong as well. As a matter of fact, most leaves, the cell walls need to be under more than 30,000 pounds of pressure, pressure per square inch before they will break. Now, if you think that your teeth are providing 30,000 pounds of pressure per square inch, I'm here to tell you, think again. Your teeth simply cannot exert that much force. And that means that no chewing, no matter how many times you chew, no matter how well you chew, no chewing is ever going to break a cell wall. Similarly, cell walls are very, very hard. Imagine a cell like a glass marble. Now we're going to go into a room where we're going to at least look in the door of a room that is filled wall to wall, floor, floor to ceiling with glass marbles. And I am going to give you a big, beautiful, sharp sword, and I am going to push you in the room and shut the door, and you can cut as many of those marbles as you want with that sword. Whack, 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 whack. That's your blender. That's your juicer. Whack, whack, whack. How many marbles have you cut yet? None? You're right. You couldn't cut any of the marble cells are small. They are microscopically small. 
the blades of the juicer, the blades of the blender are large. Let me give you an example of this. Cell size is different, but your average cell, it takes one million of them to fit into a printed period in a book. You can begin to see how really enormous. The blades of that blender and the blades of that juicer are, and why it is that they truly cannot break down cell walls at all anymore than you could cut the marble with your sword in that room. So what do we get when we juice? When we juice, basically what we are doing is we are throwing out the vast majority of the nutrition of the plant, and we are left with colored, flavored water. The coloring material in those juices generally cannot be used by the body. And when I was at Hippocrates with Anne and people were drinking wheatgrass juice, um, some of them would come a little alarmed because their feces were bright green. Because you cannot utilize the chlorophyll or the carotenes or whatever it is in the food that you are eating raw. You're simply not getting that. You're making a green drink, you're juicing if you are eating those foods raw and you're not getting any minerals, you're not getting any vitamins, and this is not my opinion. This is an actual hard scientific fact. If you want to know more about this, I'm going to refer you to my YouTube called the Raw versus Cooked Debates. And you will learn a lot more about what I'm talking about, about cell walls, how we break cell walls, and why it is that in a nourishing herbal infusion, we are using dry plants because those cell walls then have already been broken, and why we're using boiling water so that we can understand that the boiling water rehydrates and cooks the dehydrated metal, thus pushing the nutrients out of the cell walls. So when we juice a plant, we are getting less than 1% or 2% of the nutrition available in that plant, and the rest of it is simply being thrown away. When we do a green drink, we are certainly doing better for ourselves. But again, because these are raw vegetables that we're talking about, we get little to no actual nourishment from them. The herbs that I use for my nourishing herbal infusions are herbs that have no scent, herbs that are rich in protein, vitamins, and minerals, and that can help our bodies. I'm looking for herbs that got good stuff in them, lots of protein, lots of phytosterols, lots of great things that I need for optimum health. My top picks are stinging nettle, oat straw, red clover, Comfrey leaf, linden flower, violet leaf, hawthorn leaf and flower, astragalus root, burdock root, rose hips, chickweed, cleavers, mullen. It's a great long list of plants, and it's not exhaustive. I could add corn silk, and I could add, you know, other plants so long as they don't have a scent. By scent, I mean like basil, like rosemary, like thyme, like mint. We don't want a scented herb because that scent comes from volatile oils, and those volatile oils can be very harsh on the kidneys, especially when brewed in quantity, as we're doing, and brewed for a very long time as well. Nourishing herbal infusions, I usually make just before I need them. So each night I make myself a quart of nourishing herbal infusion. All I need to drink is a quart of liquid. I get the other quart that I need from my food. Yes, humans need two quarts, but they don't need to consume those two quarts. And what I consume is that entire quart of nourishing herbal infusion on a daily basis. I've been doing this for nearly 30 years at this point, and I see nothing but increasing benefit. Are nourishing herbal infusions tonics or are they nourishment? Well, let's put it to the test. If we drink nourishing herbal infusion, do we get the nourishment? Yes. Is it dependent on doing it again? No. 
So with Nourishing Herbal Infusions, we're looking at actual nourishment here that is going to build uh, your organs and your organism. Lots of interesting things here. Nourishing Herbal Infusions, I think, are definitely better than juicing or green drinks. Gemini, I can't believe it. We've come to the end of another show. A very interesting show. Green blessings, everybody. Thanks for being with me. Thank you, Susan. This concludes part 19 of our discussion on the seven medicines, the wise woman way with Susan Wheat at Time Monk Radio.